competitor we have coming up, her name is uh, Erica Bowden. She is uh, fetching me beer. There she is. <laughs> and uh, this is a subject that's like is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I think it's very interesting what's going on in California and in craft malting. Um, Erica is a freelance journalist who claims beer, booze, and backcountry on her website as a mantra. <laughs> uh, and uh, I've had many chats with her. Uh, Erica has been researching the topic, and we have some uh, very uh, interesting people here with us today to talk about craft malting and, and everything that's going on uh, as a, a periphery industry uh, to, to craft beer. So it's it's something that's very small and it's it's something that we're, we're only just kind of finding our way through uh, as ca craft brewers. There, there, there's not a lot going on yet, but uh, I'll, I'll shut up now and, and let Erica take the stage and, and, and let these guys who know a whole lot more about it than me uh, get up here as well. Hi. Hi. I'm Erica Bolden, and this is California Barley and Craft Malting. And I have three lovely panelists with me here today. Can you get in on that chair? No, I'm going to stand. Um, immediately to my right, we have Niall Zacherly from Mad Fritz Brewing Company in Napa, California. Niall has been using Craft Malt uh, in his beers for about a year, and he's sourcing from all over the United States using different regional craft malt. Uh, next to him we have Curtis Davenport, the one scooting, the tall one. Curtis is from California Craft Malt and he is working out of the Bay Area currently. He's been both growing and malting barley here in California for a few years now. He's actually how I got uh, introduced to this subject to begin with. I wrote an article on him last year and then, you know, the rest is history. Tom, obviously you know from El Segundo Brewing Company and the LA Brewers Guild. Very important person to know. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to have the panelists say a little something about how they got interested in craft malt. And then we're going to do a couple questions. The first thing I want to say though before, well, as you're listening, uh, Niall brought some beer from Napa for us to taste, which is all using different regional malt. And it's going to be right over here. Uh, as soon as we have a table set up, and you can all sample it, and it's really fantastic. So, over to Niall. Okay, so uh, what got me interested in craft malt is... All right. Um, we're trying to scoot together. Share the love. Um, so, Mad Fritz Brewing Company started out with the idea of making single variety craft malt beers. So there are very few beers that are made with single variety barleys and it's impossible to really define where your ingredients come from in your beers. Uh, and this was one way of doing it. It was reaching out to regional, local uh, craft maltsters, meaning small mom and pop shops, I call them, husband and wives, or just folks that have, like Curtis that have gotten their act together found a farmer, started growing barley, and then hand malted it via floor malting or pneumatic malting. So I reached out to these folks across the country. I started with a small uh, malting company in Reno and uh, using single variety Copeland and started building our beer styles off of the ingredients. So kind of like a wine, a wine starts with the grapes and you work on a style and an approach uh, with that grape to make that wine. So. With Mad Fritz, every beer is defined by its raw materials. So each single variety barley has a certain personality and a certain character that you'll get. And we'll, we'll taste through these um, after the panel. But uh, that's what really got me interested is where does your beer come from? You know, you might know where the hops come from. You know where the brewery is. You know where the water is from, hopefully from the brewery, but maybe not. Maybe from the municipalities. You know, you don't really know exactly. Uh, where your beer is from. So that's something to ask, you know, what's in your glass? We are what we we drink, right? We are what we eat. So that was the foundation. That's what got Mad Fritz interested in craft malt, and that's what we do. Yeah, so I am uh, Curtis Davenport, and um, I got into malting from the agricultural angle. So I was um, growing fruits and vegetables in Santa Barbara County, and... Um, 
we had some land that uh, we couldn't irrigate and so I started looking at different options for dry farmed crops and, and uh, saw a lot of potential in grains. Um, and so I started growing barley and I was enjoying making beer with friends and kind of as Niall referenced, saw a, a big divide between um, kind of how craft beer is marketed often as a very you know, local product, um, but that doesn't necessarily uh, connect to you know, local agriculture in any meaningful way. And so um, that's kind of what got me into it. I wanted to, to connect local farmers like myself um, with local brewers. And uh, I got, you know, to be honest, I'm not really in craft malting yet. I, I hope to be soon. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it's something that uh, I, I came from the food industry. I was uh, in the restaurant industry for a long time and uh, very interested in the, the slow food, local, local food uh, industry. Uh, big fan of the Santa Monica Farmers Markets, was going there a lot. Uh, made friends with a local farmer named Alex Weiser. Um, and he started growing uh, some heirloom uh, grains uh, a few years back. And, and I said, well, you know, can you grow barley? And, and can, we, can we do that? <laughs> uh, because it doesn't really exist. And uh, it was about the same time Erica wrote the, the, the article on, on Curtis here. And, and so I got to know Curtis. And, and we're, I think, going to have... Yeah, uh, <laughs> we're, Alex has got uh, quite quite a lot of Copeland barley planted out in Tehachapi down here in Southern California, and uh, I'm really looking forward to getting Curtis to malt it and uh, get it into the brew house and, and see what we can do with it. Uh, it was uh, another one of the impetus was Michael Pollan, uh, a very famous food writer, uh, gave a speech at CBC last year uh, and was talking about making making our process more local and making our process more sustainable and I, and I I think that here in Southern California one way to do that for sure is 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 growing barley here because I, I think it's a, a really viable option all right that's the perfect segue into my first question which is what makes California California barley unique what are the advantages to growing barley here particularly Curtis maybe you want to start because you have a lot of experience on the growing side uh, yeah, like I mentioned, it the uh, me getting into malting came from looking for kind of drought-friendly crops. Um, so this was maybe four years ago when I don't know. I guess we weren't in quite an extreme drought as uh, we weren't in a crisis yet. But uh, you know, certainly there are the majority of crops grown in California don't match with how much water we actually have and, and barley is kind of a rare exception where you know with 16 inches of rainfall that's more than enough to grow a barley crop um, and so yeah I think it actually makes a lot of sense for for California growers to to look into barley as an option and and that's going to require a lot of support from um, California brewers to hopefully you know offer a premium price for a, a product that maybe doesn't compete as, you know, can't compete so much with strawberries or really high value crops, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll add, I, I was talking with Alex Weiser. Uh, unfortunately, they, they have a big dinner out at the farm uh, for this very topic, uh, actually, today. Uh, uh, but uh, when you're talking about, to them, and, and, you know, Curtis said 16 inches, and uh, I'm talking to Alex and John, and, and they're saying, you know, as long as it's at the right time, they, you can really grow with even a lot less, uh, which is, I think, really, really, really interesting here. And, and you know, I, I don't know a lot about the flavor pro profile, so I, I, I'm, I'm excited to hear what Niall has to say, but that's one thing that really hasn't been explored either in, in the craft beer industry is the, the flavor profiles that we can get out of the farming techniques uh, in, in through growing barley, you know, I mean that that's happening in hops uh, in a large way, and and you know, I mean you see all the IPAs out there, and, and I mean El Segundo, we make tons of IPA, and it's a really awesome, but the really, it really hasn't been explored flavor profile wise uh, very much uh, as to what can what can be done there. Uh, I, I think this will probably segue into maybe your next question, but I think uh, you know. 
the question what's unique about California barley, I think also, you know, we have to ask what's unique about malting in California, um, or what's unique about uh, malting at the scale that that we would malt at for, um, for craft brewers. Um, and that's where, you know, there's a lot of flavor that can be developed during the malting process. Um, and so, uh, you know, starting with specific varieties and be able to preserve those flavors and then introducing uh, flavors based on how we're malting is going to make our products very unique. Yeah, we're in a market that really particularly loves hop-driven beers. Everybody here knows that. And uh, giving proper acknowledgement to malt, which provides all of the fermentable sugars, a lot of the base flavors, a lot of the aromatics that are often undershadowed by hops. I think this is a really exciting um, time for Southern California to sort of wake up and see that there's a lot more to, to beer than hops. Uh, so my next question is a little bit more for you two, and that's to do with how you see these malts coming into the marketplace. Uh, what are some of the challenges uh, between, I know Niall, you've been sourcing from all over the US, so I imagine shipping gets quite expensive for that. So what, what would you say are some of the challenges to bringing malt to consumers through beer? Yeah, as a very small brewery, we're technically a nano brewery, and uh, we wouldn't be able to be even a seven or a 10 barrel brewery sourcing craft malt at this point. I mean, we're still very early on in the development of both growers and maltsters around the country. And so even as a nano brewery, uh, everything's barrel aged that I make, everything's single variety. So I'm reaching out to, you know, I could blend all these craft malts and kind of blend away the flavor. But that's technically what Great Western, Brees, a lot of these folks are doing. And so when you just get a big, you know, silo full of malt or a bag full of two row, you don't really know, you've lost the personality, you've lost that sense of place, you've lost California malt, you've lost the soil profile, you know, the rain shadow or the rain you got that year. I mean, obviously there's challenges with growing barley like any crop, and you can kind of blend that stuff away. Um, but when you're a craft maltster and you're running a very small business that relies on raw material grown in uh, a regional place, uh, you know, sometimes you have a crop that, you know, doesn't turn out. And so you lose that crop and you got another farmer that'll take its place potentially. And uh, so that's what I've had to do is uh, we're sourcing from Pennsylvania, New York, New York State, uh, Nevada, Oregon, and Colorado just to make these single variety beers. So that's the challenge. Uh, and But it's not unattainable. I mean, this is, if we go back to pre-prohibition, I mean, we used to drink, the beers we used to drink were grown fairly near where we drank them. Uh, we just didn't really think about it. And, um, you know, we kind of lost a sense of place with where our beer's from. And that's really what craft malt is all about. And so slowly with folks like Curtis and, and Tom out there, you know, and, and obviously Erica, adding light to where these raw materials come from, more, more and more people will ask, you know, hey, where was this barley grown? Where is this beer from? And um, I think it's just a matter of time. More and more beers will source craft malt. It's more expensive. It's not, you're not, you know, the beers will cost more, but this is something we need to ask for. So as a small brewery, the flavor is there and we'll taste it in the beers. When you taste these beers, you'll taste these single varieties and it'll be clear as, as daylight. So um, I'll pass that off to Curtis here to carry on. Um, well, I think you answered that pretty well. I, I would say the biggest hurdle that I see is, you know, there's every day it seems like there's a brewer who wants to work with local ingredients, um, you know, for a whole variety of reasons. And then there's also a ton of farmers who want to grow for local brewers, but uh, kind of all the infrastructure in between is not in place. Um, and that, that's for a number of reasons, mostly because in the U.S. and worldwide, grain is, you know, handled just in huge quantities as a you know bulk commodity, and there's not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of businesses that operate at the same scale as a small grower or a small brewer to you know be that middleman. And so, um, really, the the malting infrastructure is, is what needs to be put in place. I'll add one thing. Just uh, I just want to add one thing on top of that because it's really interesting. I think if we look back at the craft beer industry, you know, 20 years ago. There, 
there were some companies that made tanks to brew beer at, at, at the size that most breweries are opening. You know, I mean, people were hobbling together dairy tanks and all sorts of stuff. And now the companies, there's, there's many companies that do it and they have a six month waiting list. So it's just, it's interesting to be at this nascent space. Uh, but I think, I think, I think it's gonna happen. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the things that I actually really love about getting into this aspect of the industry is the transparency that comes with it and, and sort of knowing, you know, I think a lot of people here like craft beer because they can walk into a brewery, they can say, hey, I see my brewer right there, I can ask him questions about, you know, his process and what's going on and having that contact is really important. So when we have that transparency all the way down to the grower and what are the grower's practices and... I, it just like adds a, a really multi-dimensional level of responsibility, accountability, transparency. These are all words that I like very much. <laughs> uh, so Curtis and I were having a conversation a little earlier today about the barley crop that got damaged last year, which a lot of people don't know about, but this was uh, mostly with, and mostly expected, uh, um, affected small growers and monsters. And this was a uh, rainfall that came right before harvest and caused some pre-germination, which compromises the, the harvest. Uh, so I want to ask Curtis, what do you think the advantages are to having craft malt and diversifying where we are growing it in terms of, you know, seeing these unexpected storms come in and how is it going to affect the yield that's available for brewers? Are there barley, barley shortages coming our way? Anything like that? Uh, well, I'm not much of an economist, so I don't know if I can answer, are there barley shortages coming our way? Um, <laughs> no, I think the bottom line is that the, the, uh, the current barley supply is very homogenous and controlled by a few companies, and that's just uh, inherently a less robust, you know, supply chain so if we have smaller growers kind of like in hops you know most hop acre hop acreage is contracted directly and um you know i think craft brewers of craft beer continues to grow and continues to use more and more malt um it might have to be more contracted malt acreage so another question which is definitely going to pertain to everybody who's listening right now is this is mostly well i guess this is for all of you but what can the consumer expect to be different about beer that's brewed with craft malt? Is it going to smell different, taste different? Um, just talk a little bit about what the flavors are that the consumers may be able to perceive that make it a different kind of beer. Niall, do you want to start? Uh, all right. Well, y as we are just growing and learning, and I feel like we're kind of in such new territory with craft malt that... I kind of keep reaching out to these different maltsters and saying, what varieties are you growing? What are those flavor profiles? And some of them have really gotten pretty uh, tricked out on it. They have spider graphs. They've really thought about, well, they taste like these components. And, and I kind of go, well, I can take your concept of what it tastes like, but then what does it taste like in my perspective, right? We all have our own palates, as the previous panel kind of pointed out. It's really up to the consumer to decide whether they like the beer that we're making or that we're crafting. Uh, that's the most important thing. So when we get this malt, you know, it's almost just kind of like an experiment. You just have no idea. And there is inherently, uh, I feel, and Curtis could add to this, is that craft malt, not only there's a variety that makes an impact on that barley, where it was grown, the season it was grown in, and then the craft maltster themselves adds another element of flavor. How do they germinate? Do they floor malt? Do they nomadically malt? Uh, do they do a warmer temperature? What's the protein level on that malt? We talked about that earlier. Um, you know, we kind of geek out on all these little intricacies of craft malt because it's such an, it's like a whole another world out there. And there's these flavor profiles, rather than just going and jumping for the next new hybridized or unique citrusy floral hop, it's kind of like, well, let's go back a little bit in time and look at what is this flavor profile I'm getting from this malt variety? And, and so that's something that I think the consumer, if you like malt-driven beers, if you like hot beers, we all like hot beers, but 
I think if you back off the hops a little bit and let it be kind of more of a secondary component, you'll find that there's this whole other world of malts and a whole other spectrum of fruit fla uh, grain flavors that are out there that will add to the, the consumer's experience. Um, and, and so that that's something that I, I think really answers the question is like you, the brewers themselves need to experiment with craft malts. They need to seek them out and you need to give them credence. You don't want to just kind of blend them off. And uh, the other thing that I think is important with craft malt is that you stick to a fairly classic fermentation. So if you add retanomyces and you start going with lactic acid uh, bacteria and souring, you start getting a whole nother aromatic profile. Now you still have that background there, but some of those, the intensities of those malts will start to be compromised a little bit. So it is important, if you're really looking for that, that uh, there's a freshness to the beer. So, but th that again, that's the style of the brewery themselves. And um, those are the things that, that uh, we look out for in the, in the brewing side. So Tom, as I'm sure everybody here knows, makes some, well, El Segundo makes some really wonderful hoppy beers. Uh, I'm just wondering, you're so keen on getting craft malt, how are you going to make beer that, that uh, showcases those malts and that the consumers will recognize is, is special for that reason? Um, you know, uh, we don't just make hoppy beer. <laughs> uh, we do make a, a great red right now, which is, I think, delicious. But, um, you know, what I think is, is probably the most exciting possibility would be kind of talking to chefs, talking to people on that side of the game and being like, hey, here's this really interesting thing going on. And they all know Alex Weiser. I mean, they all know Alex Weiser. And so, you know, doing that and being like, hey, what kind of, you know, talking to them and trying to find out what kind of profile they're looking for. Like, you know, I, I often get, um, you know, these restaurateurs, they're like, oh, I want you to make a beer just for us. And, oh, oh, we'll buy two whole kegs a week. And I'm like, that's not going to work out. But what, you know, they always want Kolsch. And I just, I keep think I keep kind of thinking, like, that would be a really awesome style to showcase, you know, there's not a lot, there's not a lot of fermentation getting in the way. It's not going to be over hopped. It's not going to be, so you could really probably showcase malt in, a, in an interesting way. And working with the maltster and the grower to be like, hey, you know, year after year to be like, this is what we're trying to achieve. And then making a beer that is is really super fruit friendly because, you know, and it, it's to, to our detriment, but, it, you know, all these guys are like, oh, IPA is too bitter and they don't want to play with it. I disagree with them and I think they should play with IPA more, but uh, that, that that's not really the point here. But, you know, I... I that's that's where I think going in playing, getting brewers and chefs talking and 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 finding out what the profile is. But I, I think you know, I, I think we've done a great job of showcasing ourselves as the hoppy brewery, and it's time for us to start now doing some other stuff. And 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 this is a this is the direction that I'm more interested in than Rob. But that doesn't you know this is the this is something that I'll be pushing on for sure. So, uh, you may not know, big work boots for getting out in the uh, fields. Um, there's a lot of crossover, actually, in, in LA. We have a, a really great um, baking industry going on here. And a lot of the times, people like Alex Weiser are not just growing for, for potentially for beer, but they're growing for these these bakers, and the, we have a, an urban flour mill, which is really cool. Um, I want to get into one more question, which is to do with consistency. And it's a difficult question. It's one that I've, I, I continue to struggle with. Right now, we think of the six pack that we get at the grocery store, we always want it to taste the same every time. You know, every time you pick up a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, you want it to taste like Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. So when we incorporate regional craft malt, sometimes there's variability. You know, you're working with a lot smaller yield, uh, so you have to make changes in the malt house, you have to make changes in the brew house, and I want to ask all of you, how, how do you think you can overcome those consistency challenges when you have a more limited supply of grain? 
I'll go first real quick. Um, as, as a craft malt brewer exclusively, I, I can tell you that it varies almost every batch. Um, there are certain malt houses that I can reliably get um, a malt bill that will be, it'll follow a fairly similar trend line almost every time. So if it's a state grown malt and then a state malted, so like the Colorado Malting Company and their scarlet variety barley, it's grown right there on the property and they've been doing it for long enough that they, they've got it pretty dialed in. So. I can anticipate a pretty similar profile every time. And that's a malt that I actually like for, I'm doing a Kolsch with that. I've done my pale lager, um, the scarlet variety. And, but there's some of the other maltsters that there's, you know, there's a, a swing. Sometimes there's more protein, sometimes there's more extract. Um, sometimes there's a little bit more of this kind of grassy herbal character, which I like. It's a little bit more grainy and uh, yeah. For our style of beers, we are not a consistent brewery. We are like, if you want variability in your beer and you want something that's got personality, that's what you're gonna get in our beer. And we're not afraid of it, we love it. We think diversity and, and giving this a sense of, of place and variety is super important. Um, and it, it really speaks to the raw materials. Uh, although that, that's not to say that it isn't important that you can't go to you know, your local grocery and pick up a Boone Amber or a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale and expect consistency. And that's obviously a really tough job to do. Uh, but, and, and I've worked in that environment uh, at Anderson Valley Brewing Company. I know what it takes. It's, it's hard. There's a lot of uh, blending on the wort side. There's a lot of blending on the, f and on the seller side to make that happen. So in our, in our realm, uh, it's gonna be more and more difficult, although it's not a, unattainable. Um, yeah, I would just say that our our challenge will to be you know to be able to make consistently quality malt. So there's you know certain variability we just won't deal with. We won't accept a lot of barley that's 14% protein. Um, yeah, well, I mean we're not trying to make a poor product, uh, but at the same time, you know there's a lot of effort in the malting industry now to make a homogenous product, and we want to make you know we want to you know where there's so much effort to destroy you know character from one variety or one location to the next you know we want to exploit that and we want to uh, you know showcase uh, different types of malt uh, but they all have to be quality you know <laughs> yeah. uh, so yeah, I, I'll, I think I'll just kind of echo what Niles was saying is yeah, I think you need to embrace diversity uh, it's, you know, it, like, yeah, of course, some of our beers, we're going to try and make them the same every time, and, and, and people come to expect that, but, uh, you know, this, the, the much the same as a winery is, is beholden to its grapes. Uh, I, I think finding some some of that in the, in the beer industry would be really great, and, and get people excited about, like, oh, you know, this year's barley crop's gonna be super awesome and it's gonna do this and this this particular beer. You know, it, it's cool that sometimes the beer's a little bit better. It's not as cool when it's not, not as good, but you know, that's just that's just how the world works. Can't always be the same. So I, I, I really think it's about the customers and, and, and the peop the consumers embracing that it's not always the same. You know what I mean? The world that's not way that's not the way the world really works. Uh, and, and if we're not homogenizing, then there's just no way we're going to get there. Um, it, for me, that, that's, that's the most exciting part about all, all of it, really, it, is, is that it, it's going to be different and there's, there's not really much you can do. And, and uh, you know, what, what Curtis said is, is just right. As long as it's quality, as long as it's good, just because it's different doesn't make it bad. So um, I'm going to say one more thing, and then we can, if, you, if anybody has any questions, think of them now. We would love to hear them. You have three great people for talking about a very esoteric subject here. Um, I will also say we're about to open up some great bottles of Mad Fritz beer, and if you get a chance to get over there, which I recommend you do, there's a very <laughs> limited supply, uh, check out the labels. Not only are they beautiful on the front, but if you look at the back of the label, you're going to get some really interesting information. It's not just IBUs and original gravity. You're going to see the source for all of Niall's ingredients, where he gets his water, where he gets his malt, where he gets his hops, 
what kind of uh, oak barrel or what kind of barrel the beer was aged in. And he's going to have a lot of great things to say about his stuff. So one more thing that if you guys just want to think really quickly, do you have any one thing that you would like to say to consumers about regional beer, about regional barley, like whether they should talk to their brewers and talk to the people who are serving them beer about why, where are my ingredients coming from? Are, are you, how are you treating them? Uh, this is a, a great opportunity to get one single plug-in if anybody wants to summarize. Or if that's too big of a task, then I'll open it up to questions. <laughs> okay. I take it back. They have nothing to say. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? Want to come up? Yeah. Hi. You got it. Hi. Uh, my name is Alonzo. Question. I, sorry, I forget your name. Curtis. Curtis. I have 40 acres of south facing, southeast facing land in Mariposa. Up, uh, it's just south of uh, Yosemite, uh, right there. Planted. Yeah. <laughs> Should I, I mean, it's right now. It's unused. So, if I go barley, what am I looking at for water? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to know exactly. I mean, without knowing what soil you're on and how much rain you get and whatnot. But, um, yeah, I mean, as barley is a pretty uh, cosmopolitan crop, you can grow it in a lot of different soils. Um, you know, it obviously does better in some than others. But um, I don't know. If you want to talk more about it, be happy to. Yeah. That's, oh. Uh, we, we can talk afterwards. Yeah. You know, that's a, it's a great question because we had, uh, we have five acres of vineyard land that's fallow, so it's not planted up in Napa Valley and in Calistoga, and we thought, what the heck, let's, let's disc it, let's seed it, we got all the farm equipment, let's just plant it, and we're harvesting it today, literally, as we speak, they're harvesting two different types of barley, we didn't water at all, we did a fall sowing, and Curtis is obviously a little bit more uh, knowledgeable about, you know, all the different farming in intricacies, but as grape growers and we always put in cover crop and so it's something we're familiar with but as he says I mean it's not rocket science anyone can grow barley but um, it depends on how you grow the barley how you treat the seeds how you sow it how you prep the soil and then you also kind of have to think of well I'm gonna do this thing but then where does it go afterwards and that's what Curtis alluded to earlier is that there aren't enough malt house craft malt houses out there yet we need everyone here to you know pool their money together and start building malt houses because that's what would change the landscape of the industry if craft malt is out there more craft brewers would ask for it it would be available now of course they have to ask for it and i think it's true that your question is a difficult question but you have to ask yourself out of all these breweries out here that we're all drinking these beers they're all great beers but you know what's their supply chain look like does it all look the same kind of I mean, and what differentiates these beers? And, and so as a consumer, you have to ask yourself that at the end of the day. And they need to be asking themselves as craft brewers, how do we make our beer better? How do we support smaller, more local community uh, groups of people and, and bring farming back? And uh, rather than having it regionalized, and oh, we get, you know, northwestern grown malts and, you know, it's all kind of blended together. And I mean, that's obviously a generalization and I want to avoid that. But that's the struggle is it's not that hard to grow, but that malting component is something that we're really lacking. And, and that's where craft malt comes in. And uh, what, what was the name of the book that uh, we, we've, that you might want to refer to the craft maltsters handbook that was written by... The Dave Thomas book, uh, the Craft Maltsters Handbook, is a great glossary book that you can kind of look at, bruise through. It talks about different varieties. Um, it's not super intensely detailed, but it starts breaking ground into this territory of craft malt, which we all need to be doing as appreciators, consumers, and producers of, of this product. 
John Mallett, who is the production manager at Bell's Brewing Company in Kalamazoo, Michigan, also just wrote the Brewer's Publication Ingredient Book on malt, called Malt, by John Mallett. Some of us were waiting on the edge of our seat for it, and it's excellent, I may say, so check it out. Um, so I want to thank all of our panelists, Tom, Curtis, and Niall, particularly Curtis and Niall, who flew down here from the Bay Area. <laughs> and invite you to come sample some Mad Fritz beer. It's going to be right over here shortly. Uh, thank you, everybody. This has been great. <laughs> you guys, Most of the people you guys have five times as many people as the open air. <laughs> so Hopefully, we'll keep building, right? <laughs> so, so we live stream this. Okay, okay, cool. And we're going to post it on YouTube. You can, uh, we have a project this time to a new project. And please, all you guys, subscribe to us because you can put it in front of We have 2,000 hits and 225 subscribers. YouTube seems to be subscribed and why they tolerate it. So, yeah. So, I had to rush my